Bill, Kentucky has always been a town that has pulled its life from the river. Today, Waterfront Park serves the community by mediating the relationship between the mighty Ohio River and the sprawling mass of infrastructure that forms the transportation backbone of the river city. Play station for people of all backgrounds. Waterfront Park is always bustling with activity, whether on a tight schedule or no schedule at all. Local residents seem to find the time and space to interact with the sprawling Riverside Park in their own way. Even during a global pandemic, you can see the level of activity that has come to define the Louisville waterfront. However, this site has not always been as welcoming as it is now. The current level of accessibility to the river's banks from the city is the result of decades of work on the part of planners and planning agencies, who have made the city's front lawn the institution that it is today. Newville's existence and development as a city is completely inseparable from its location on the Ohio. In the second half of the 18th century, the first colonizing people formed a settlement on Corn Island, which was later moved to the current site of Newville's downtown. Later renamed in honor of the French king, Newville grew at first through the process of land granting. David Kerrin, who was later largely responsible for Waterfront Park as it exists today, is acutely aware of this aspect of Newville's history and the implication it had on the river's edge. We always have to point out Louisville was the one of the few cities, maybe the only city on the Ohio River that had to be where it was because of the falls of the Ohio. These falls, formed from water pouring over a natural outcropping of limestone, served to divide the Ohio River into its upper and lower sections. As the Ohio was more accurately surveyed and portage sites became more formalized, George Rogers Clark worked to create the first master plan of the city. This original master plan recognized the importance of public access to the riverfront, and Clark qualified the riverfront as space not developable for private purposes. By the early 1800s, Louisville was already a major trade stop, decreasing conflict with native populations and increased supply lines aided city growth, and an 1830 project by a private company created the Louisville and Portland Canal, which greatly improved the navigability of the river. City growth increased along with river development projects, and by 1855, the city covered most of what is present in today downtown. By 1880, the government completed its consolidation of canal shares and successfully removed the river tolls, further increasing river trade. Throughout this development, the riverfront largely remained publicly accessible. As shown here, buildings did not extend to the river's edge, and the space was open for public and commercial use. This arrangement didn't last forever. Through multiple agreements, such as the lease signed by the Inland Waterways Company in 1922, the city began to allow construction and heavy industry along the river's edge. This transition quickened after the Great Flood of 1937, which resulted in the wealthy moving eastward and away from the downtown and, by extension, the riverfront. By the late 1940s, the waterfront was a mass of heavy industry, sand and gravel companies, and warehouses. Because the land at the river's edge was so terribly industrial and commercial, uh, it became the natural place for them to build railroad lines. Following this same logic, the river's edge was a sensible place for several new major roadways. In 1970, construction of I-64 and I-65 is completed, creating yet another barrier to public access of the riverfront. The so-called Spaghetti Junction wove several major elevated highways together along the edge of the Ohio. All of this development served to change the nature of Louisville's waterfront away from Clark's original master plan. Over the many, many, many decades, there had been a turn away from the river as an amenity for the public, other than this commercial aspect. Even amid this shift in use for the Louisville waterfront, public and governmental focus was returning to the riverfront. In 1964 and 1965, the city applied for Federal Housing Administration loans to develop housing along the water's edge. Although these proposals were denied, the very act of application helps capture the changing views towards acceptable use along the river. Spurred on by a mix of public and private development near the edge of downtown, the city began work on a project known as the Belvedere, in essence a public park and plaza sitting atop a car park. Long-time local resident Patsy Dunnigan recalls the early days of the Belvedere after its 1972 construction. Downtown Louisville enjoyed it on lunch hours. Uh, there were festivals there after, after work hours. There were wonderful ethnic festivals on weekends. Uh, it was really nice. There 
was not much open space in downtown Louisville at that point in time. With public support clearly in favor of a return to riverfront accessibility, the city laid the groundwork for later development. Through discussion with property owners and the non-renewal of several leases of waterfront property, the city began the process of clearing the riverfront of industry. There was a long history of concern about the front door to Louisville and for that matter the front door to Kentucky. And so the, even the landowners who were there understood that there had been years of there had been years of of public support for change in that area, for uh, significant improvements to be made. In conjunction with this, the city began construction of the Riverport Industrial Park in a different location to provide a new site for the industrial functions previously supplied at the water's edge. Our park is 85 acres total. Uh, in, in that 85 acre footprint, there were two open bulk storage facilities. There were two asphalt terminals. There were three scrap yards. There was a dry concrete plant. There were two uh, or three other very heavy industrial kind of uses. Once this land was cleared, the city allowed the newly formed Waterfront the Development Corporation to acquire over 12 acres of land to begin the process of construction and planning. Cass Harris, who sat on the board of the WDC for about a year, recalls the build-up that led to the city's re-engagement with the waterfront. And at that point, it was still a, a three-way commission uh, between the state, the county, and the city. And um, it was, I think it started in 86, and um, it was something that had been talked about forever and ever and ever. Um, in local government circle. The WDC wasted little time, and by 1988, the city had identified the waterfront as one of the nine districts within the Central Business District. The WDC Master Plan, published in 1990, called for the selection of a master plan designer. Later in 1990, Hargreaves Associates is selected to serve in this capacity. With the WDC, Hargreaves developed a multi-phase process to transform the riverfront into a new center of recreation. In 1999, after several years of construction, phase one, including bike trails to connect to other city parks, opens to the public. In 2000, docks are installed and, in 2004, phase two opens. Also in 2004, the city and the WDC use eminent domain to seize the Big Four Railroad Bridge. After the previous owners unsuccessfully appealed the decision, the way was paved for construction to begin on new access ramps to the structure. In 2010, the ramps are completed and the Big Four lawn opens, serving as a landing for those using the bridge to walk to and from southern Indiana. Most recently, the Lynn Family Stadium was constructed adjacent to the Big Four Lawn, further strengthening the connection between the park and the urban fabric. Today, Waterfront Park serves not only as an incredible community space for people living in and around Louisville, but also as an example of a riverfront reclaimed and a city returned to its roots. The story of Waterfront Park is the story of Louisville, a city that has always drawn its life from the river.